D E Vacorda. D E Vacorda, August Falter of Galair, Quig on Lake Sho Inu. Hello and welcome to this afternoon's Wild Goose Lecture, Cracking O'Reilly's Code. My name is Anne Golden and I will be your MC for today. Before we get started, I have a few housekeeping items to mention. First of all, please could everyone turn off your mobile phones or put them on silent now. Just to let you know that the toilets are located out this door here, up the ramp and in on your right. And in case of an emergency, please listen to and follow the instructions of the museum staff and volunteers. To commence this afternoon's proceedings, I invite forward Dr. Alec Coles, OBE, the CEO of the West Australian Museum, to formally welcome us here to the WA Maritime Museum. Thank you, Anna. Kaya, Wanju, Wanju. Detranana, August Falcher. That's all you'll be getting today, <laughs> from me anyway. Um, I always mind you to thinking on occasions like this of the um, Irish singer Luca Bloom, uh, Christy Moore's younger brother, who always used to say, uh, wherever you go, well, there you are. And uh, here we are today uh, at the WA Maritime Museum. So good afternoon and welcome here in Fremantle, while up. Uh, I would say on Victoria Quay, but probably in front of this audience, we won't talk about the, the monarchy, but uh, on occasions like this, I always push my Welsh heritage to the front and uh, the English bit back. Um, I obviously want to begin by acknowledging the uh, traditional custodians of the land on which we meet here, the Wajak Noongar people, and pay my respects to elders past and present. And uh, in doing so, I always like to point out, and sorry for those who've heard me say this before, but this is a really significant place for uh, Wajak people. Um, right behind me here, uh, and you have a look at it afterwards, we go, there's the remains of a limestone bar, uh, and that bar used to cross the river. Um, and uh, it was a very important place for Wajak people to meet and fish, particularly Wajak men. And of course, in uh, the process of making the river navigable, um, uh, C.Y. O'Connor and uh, its engineers actually destroyed that bar. And of course, that was a, a sorry time, a very sorry thing for Wajak people. It's a very important part of, of the dreaming story around the rainbow serpent and the crocodile that fought. And this was, this was part of the crocodile's tail. And Wajamup, um, uh, Rottnest Island, was, if you like, the, the other element of that. So. Um, important uh, it was, and I'm pleased at least we've been able to remember that, but we do remember it when we acknowledge uh, our traditional custodians. Um, it's a really great pleasure to welcome um, uh, the, the triple F, uh, as I like to call it, back here to Fremantle again. Um, I was uh, uh, disappointed uh, that they didn't adopt my suggestion of a few years ago to add another F onto that, but anyway, it's uh, not gone forward. Um, but I would like to acknowledge also some of our special guests here today, particularly just uh, uh, Marty, Marty Kavanagh, the uh, uh, Honorary Consul of Ireland here in WA, uh, your speaker, Dr. Kate Gregory, uh, Batty historian, and I have to say a former trustee of the WA Museum, so it's great to welcome you back, uh, uh, Kate. And of course, the indefatigable, if that's the right word, Margot O'Byrne. Uh, so Margot, thank you um, for, for being here. Um, I'm sure there's no, not much point in me stealing everybody else's lines uh, about um, uh, John Boyle O'Reilly, uh, born in 1844, Nidrohada, and uh, obviously joined the Irish Republican Brotherhood, better known as the Fenians, in 1864. And that very much defined the rest uh, of his life, um, uh, his involvement. He was obviously um, found guilty of treason. He was sentenced to death. Um, but um, uh, that was commuted, and he was actually transported uh, to WA. 
I guess some people at the time would have thought that that would have been a worse fate possibly than, than death, but uh, uh, as we know, things, uh, things changed along the way. Um, and of course, is remembered through these wild goose lectures, so it's great to see that again. And of co all around, Fremantle, immortalized in popular culture, whether it's, you know, pubs called the Moondine, or the uh, the wine, 19 crimes wine that you see in the in the bottle shops all around here, uh, has really become such an important part of our culture, uh, particularly because of his involvement in the Catalpa uh, escape. But I just, um, and again, some of you will be familiar with this, but uh, uh, he became a great champion of um, civil rights causes uh, right around the world. And the, the magazine, The Crisis, which still exists today, uh, which was originally the um, uh, magazine for the uh, National Association of the Advancement of Coloured People in the, in the US. Um, when he died, he described and he said, O'Reilly defended the oppressed Negroes as he had defended the oppressed Indians, as sincerely and zealously as he had all his life um, defended the oppressed of his own race. It was morally impossible for him to do otherwise. And so for that reason, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honour actually to welcome uh, you back here today um, to welcome the Fenians Fremantle and Freedom, the Wild Goose Lecture and to welcome uh, Dr Kate Gregory back as well. So thank you very much uh, and uh, please enjoy the afternoon and thanks for coming here once again. Thank you. Thank you, Alec, for that very warm welcome. So Fremantle and Western Australia, more broadly, has placed itself at the forefront of Fenian history and research. As some of you may know, 62 Fenians, including my great-granduncle, John Golden, were transported on board the Hugomont to Fremantle, arriving here in January 1868. On board the Hugomont, the Fenians wrote a newspaper, The Wild Goose, a collection of ocean waifs. The Fenians produced seven issues of this carefully laid out and beautifully decorated handwritten newspaper. The paper contains songs, stories, articles, advice, poems, and even comedy, and it pr provides an incredible insight into the transportation experiences of the Fenians. Only one copy of each issue was created, and it was read aloud by the Fenians with the aim of providing entertainment on board the ship during its long voyage to Fremantle. So why the wild goose? Since the 1600s, the term wild geese has been used to refer to Irish exiled soldiers who believed their exile would be temporary and strategic, and that they would one day see Ireland again. The 62 Fremantle Fenians, who arrived here 154 years ago, insisted on being treated as political prisoners and not as convicts. In this light, the title of the Wild Goose for their newspaper seems entirely appropriate. The Wild Goose newspaper, now carefully stored in the Mitchell Library, the State Library of New South Wales, is also available for viewing online and contributors to the newspaper included John Flood, Dennis Cashman, John Sarsfield Casey, and of course, John Boyle O'Reilly. Our group, Fenians, Fremantle and Freedom, hold various Fenian events to bring to light the significant contribution the Fenians have made to the Australian, Irish and international history. And it seems only fitting to remember their plight and to name our annual lecture after their Hugomont newspaper. I now invite forward Fred Ray, who, like John Boyle O'Reilly, is a skilled compositor. Fred will sing The Cry of the Dreamer, a poem written by John Boyle O'Reilly in 1868. Are we on? Yes, I think we are. Uh, I am a composer. Um, I don't have blood gone through my veins. I've got reflex blue running through my veins. 
This is what John Ball O'Reilly would have been doing on a setting stick like this when he was working as a compositor. Who is familiar with this tool of the trade of a compositor? And in the first verse of the song, which I'm going to sing, he says, in the crowded houses, I'm tired of planning and toiling in the crowded houses of men. This is a compositor's room in the old days. In the eight, he died in 18, 1880, 1890, sorry, four years before movable, or the, the, the liner type came into existence. So this was all done by hand, the newspapers. So if you read the first, when I sing the first four lines, I'm tired of planning and toiling, the crowded hive men, heart weary of building and spoiling, and spoiling and building again. So imagine doing a whole newspaper, individual bits of type. Once you got the newspaper finished, all the type went back into the cases for the next newspaper. So he was tired and weary of building, of spoiling and building again. And that's, a, that's where I think the first verse comes from. I've been working on this song uh, since the, the, the committee asked me to sing it. And, and it's, uh, it's been annoying me, that first verse. I was trying to work out exactly what it was about. So uh, it's wonderful. And by the way, a little bit of trivia. Uh, this year would have been the 150th anniversary of the wedding of Mary Murphy and John Bell O'Reilly. And they got married in 1872. Well, I'm tired of planning and toiling in the crowded hives of men. Heart weary of building and spoiling, spoiling and building again. And I long for the dear old river where I dream my youth away. For a dreamer lives forever and a toiler dies in a day. And I'm sick of the showy seeming Of a life that's half a lie Of the faces lined with scheming And the throng that hurries by From the sleepless thoughts and ever I would go where the children play For a dreamer lives forever and a thinker dies in a day I can feel no pride nor pity For the burden the rich endure There is nothing sweet in the city But the patient lives of the poor all oh, the little hands too skillful And the child mind choke with weeds The daughter's heart grown willful And the father's heart that bleeds No, no, from the streets rude bustle From the trophies of Martin stage I would fly to the woods low rustle and the meadows kindly page Let me dream as of old by the river And be loved by the dream always For a dreamer lives forever And a toiler dies in a day For a dreamer lives forever and the toiler dies in a day. Today's Wild Goose Lecture is presented by Dr. Kate Gregory. Kate is the Batty Historian at the State Library of Western Australia where she explores and shares the rich collections of the JS Battery Library of Western Australian history. Previously, Kate worked with the National Trust of Australia and was curator at Freshwater Bay Museum.
At Fremantle Prison, she helped curate the Escape, Fremantle to Freedom exhibition. With a PhD in art history, Kate also served as a trustee of the Western Australian Museum. Her book, From the Barracks to the, Bur From the, Barracks to the Burrup, the National Trust in Western Australia, co-authored with Andrea Withcombe, was shortlisted for the Western Australian Premier's Book Awards. You may, you may often hear Kate on her regular radio interview segments with both the ABC and 6PR, discussing many items from the vast State Library collection. This afternoon, in Cracking O'Reilly's Code, Kate will provide you with a rare and exciting insight into Fenian John Boyle O'Reilly's Little Book of Poetry. Three of O'Reilly's poems, read by Michael Sheehy, Jennifer McGrath and Brigida Desabrock, will intersperse and complement Kate's lecture. Now, without further ado, I invite forward Dr. Kate Gregory to deliver the 2022 Wild Goose Lecture, Cracking O'Reilly's Code. Thank you, Anne. Oh my goodness, I feel we could stop here. <laughs> that was wonderful. Fred, thank you so much. That was a wonderful rendition of, of John Boyle O'Reilly's um, Cry of the Dreamer. And thank you, Anne, for that introduction. That was just kind words. And to Alec, it's so wonderful to be back here in this incredible museum perched on Fremantle Harbour. There couldn't be a better place to share the story of John Boyle O'Reilly's book of poems. And I'd like to also thank the Fenians Fremantle and Freedom Association for inviting me to give the Wild Goose Lecture. I feel very privileged. It's a tremendous opportunity to share this incredible WA and indeed international story. I thank Joy Lafroy, Margot O'Byrne, Peter Murphy in particular, who have been so generous with my many questions over the past couple of months. Thank you also to the wider committee for contributing to this lecture with the wonderful music, Fred, and readings from John Boyle O'Reilly's Book of Poems, and I think making this a much richer experience for the audience. I would like to start by acknowledging the Wajak Noongar people on whose land we are meeting today for this Wild Goose Lecture, and to pay my respects to their elders past and present. Many people have assisted with the story that I present you with today. My colleagues at the State Library have undertaken new research into the provenance of this book of poems by John Boyle O'Reilly. And our State Library volunteers have fully transcribed the book, making it much easier to read, although I have to say reading John Boyle O'Reilly's handwriting is quite lovely. Past staff and volunteers of the State Library researched and verified the book's authenticity when it was first donated in 1989. Their work in the days before digitisation of archival records required extensive correspondence with librarians, archivists and curators, all by letter. Now I note I can access online many of these archives based in the USA and Ireland and often just pull up these beautifully digitised records within a few minutes. <coughs> I was enthralled from the moment I first saw John Ball O'Reilly's book of poems back in 2006. I was working on the exhibition Escape Fremantle to Freedom at Fremantle Prison where it was exhibited for the first time and so far only time. Audiences loved it, and I can see why. An original handwritten book of poems by Irish poet, writer, and Fenian political activist John Boyle O'Reilly, dated 1868, when he was a political prisoner in Western Australia. Shorthand code on the front and back cover, bound in vellum with a brass clasp latch that still works perfectly, pressed flowers inside. It's romantic, dramatic, mysterious, and it's still here in Western Australia after 154 years. In this lecture, I will trace the life of this book of poems and the dramatic story surrounding its creation, its concealment for many decades before being passed down through one family and finally coming to light when it was donated to the State Library in 1989. 
I will also share with you the story of its archival life, how it came to the State Library, how its authenticity was verified, its digitisation and its preservation. Today, it is undoubtedly a treasure of the State Library's collection and it's accessible for everyone to view online through the State Library's catalogue. This book, is amongst the earliest creative writing and creative work undertaken in Western Australia. A creative practice which seeded the writing of the first novel to be set in Western Australia, Moondyne Joe, A Story from the Underworld, published by John Boyle O'Reilly in 1879. The influence of this novel continues to reverberate in the West Australian psyche. Moondyne is one of the first historical characters, first stories of, in and about Western Australia, and is closely based on John Boyle O'Reilly's experiences in Western Australia. Some of the more persistent tropes about Western Australia have their origins in Moondyne. The idea of Western Australia, for example, is the Cinderella state. O'Reilly writes in Moondyne, Western Australia is the Cinderella of the South. She has no gold like her sisters. Well, this proved to be wrong. <laughs> So, to unpack the meaning of this book of poems, I'd like to take you back through time to chart the passage of this little book from now to its creation. Let's take a look at the book of poems by O'Reilly. So the book of poems is now held in the rare room of the State Library, carefully preserved in archival conditions. From a conservation perspective, it is in excellent condition. The vellum cover made from calf skin, an original binding and pages within are yellowed with age, but otherwise in very good condition. The writing in black ink and occasional notes in pencil by O'Reilly are clear and stable. The brass latch is stamped Truscott, London, and is in working order. There are some ink blotches on the pages and a little foxing from high humidity or temperature fluctuations. There are a few marks left by an insect caught in the pages here and there. On each inside cover, there's a faint impression where an envelope was once stored. A single page has been torn out from the portion of the book containing the handwritten poems and three consecutive pages torn out from the blank pages towards the back. There is handwriting just visible in the margins of these torn pages, tantalising but unreadable. Press flowers found in the book when it was donated to the State Library have been identified recently by Professor Stephen Hopper as two species. One is wood violet from Eurasia, and that's the one on the left and the top centre, and a specimen of Hardenbergia, which is native to the southwest of Australia on the right. The physical condition provides clues and fragments of evidence about this book's journey over time. The book's condition might allow us to speculate that it is unlikely to have undergone a sea voyage. No spills, only a little oxidisation of the copper metal in the brass clasp. A comparison is needed with surviving original records from the Hugomont ship that transported O'Reilly to Fremantle, and this will be a piece of further research. There are two journals by fellow Fenian prisoners that were written on the Hugomont voyage. Dennis Cashman's diary, now held in the J.Y. Joyner Library in East Carolina University in Grenville, USA, and John Sarsfield Casey's diary, held in the National Library of Ireland. There are also the seven editions of the Wild Goose newsletter, written on board the Hugomont, and now held by the Mitchell Library at the State Library of New South Wales. Where did O'Reilly obtain this book? Did he bring it with him on the Hugomont? Or could he have obtained it in the colony of Western Australia after his arrival? The name Truscott London is on the brass clasp, but this book could have been acquired in WA or even made here from imported parts. The book is small, about 19 centimetres by 13 centimetres and two centimetres deep. It's easily carried, slipped into a pocket. Stenography shorthand covers the front and the back cover and the book opens with a dedication to Father Patrick McCabe, signed by O'Reilly on 3rd of April, 1868. It is half filled with 19 of O'Reilly's original handwritten poems in black ink, and the remaining half of the book is empty. 
O'Reilly's handwritten compositions show crossings out, rearrangements to the verse, and a process of editing. Four poems were later published with minor changes. Three were published in Songs from the Southern Seas, which was O'Reilly's first book of poetry in 1873. And one was published in The Pilot in May 1870, a Boston newspaper that O'Reilly later edited. This is in fact perhaps one of early, O'Reilly's earliest published poems entitled Pondering when published, but in this original handwritten book of poems is called Night Thoughts, and we're going to hear this a little later. Nine of the 19 poems appear in The Wild Goose. The subject matter of the poems is deeply personal and reflects O'Reilly's strong Irish patriotism and show his affection and yearning for Ireland, but also his emerging talent as a poet. There are several different categories of poems within the book. Poems that are rich in imagery about the beauty of Ireland. There are Fenian-inspired poems glorifying the fight for Ireland's freedom from British rule. There are prison poems touching on the grim experience of imprisonment. There are exile poems, time-passing themed poems about memory, nostalgia for childhood, poems that reflect his deeply held Catholicism. And there are narrative poems and poems reflecting more philosophical questions and emotional quandaries. There is one poem, partial and dra in draft form, that was definitely composed in Western Australia. And this is concealed in the stenography shorthand on the front and back cover. We will return to this to uncover the contents of this poem in the, later in the lecture. So this book is not a diary, nor an account of O'Reilly's imprisonment and transportation to the colony. But these poems draw directly from O'Reilly's experiences during the years 1863 to 1868. And because they are poems, they reflect O'Reilly's emotions and his interior and creative life from this time. As contemporary readers today, we are very privileged to have access to this. Let's hear the poem Farewell, which is the first poem in the book and appears in the first edition of the Wild Goose newsletter, where O'Reilly composed it on the ship on October the 12th, 1867. And I'd like to welcome Mike Sheehy to the stage, to the lectern. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Farewell. Oh, how hard and how sad it is to speak. That last word of parting, forever to break. The fond ties and affections that cling round your heart. From home and from friends and from country to port. But tis harder when parted to try to forget. Though it grieves to remember, tis vain to regret. The sad word must be spoken and memories spell. Now steals o'er me sadly. Farewell, oh farewell. Farewell to thy green hills, the valleys and plains, my poor blighted country in exile and chains. Are thy sons doomed to linger? O oh God, who didn't bring thy children to Zion from Egypt's proud king? We implore thy great mercy, O oh, stretch forth thy hand and guide back her sons to this poor blighted land. Nevermore thy fair face am I destined to see. Even the savage loves home, but his crime to love thee. 
Oh, how hard it is those tendrils to break that have grown round my heart. But it's over, and memories spill. Now steers o'er me sadly. Farewell. A oh, farewell. Thank you, Mike. So, let's go back in time to understand a little more of John Boyle O'Reilly's story, his passage to the colony of Western Australia and his eventual escape on the American whaler, the gazelle. Who was John Boyle O'Reilly? So John Boyle O'Reilly is the most well-known of the Fenian political prisoners transported to Western Australia in 1868 on the last convict ship to Australia, the Hugomont. O'Reilly was a young poet and journalist and later editor and writer, a Fenian activist and author of the first novel set in Western Australia, Moondine Joe. O'Reilly was born in 1844 in Douth County Meath in Ireland. He was the third of eight children, two sons and six daughters. His father, a teacher and schoolmaster at the National School attached to Douth Castle, and his mother, a matron in the local orphanage, and O'Reilly was educated by his father. The Great Famine, a period of mass starvation and disease in Ireland, was the setting for his childhood and changed the course of his life. After his older brother contracted tuberculosis, John, at age 11, was apprenticed to the Dragida Argus news newspaper instead of his brother. In 1859, an uncle and aunt brought O'Reilly to England to stay with them where he was taken on as an apprentice journalist with the Preston Guardian. It was here that O'Reilly learnt shorthand and the business of journalism, and he spent about three and a half years in Preston, England. In early 1863, he became involved with the Irish Republican Brotherhood, the Fenian movement, a movement committed to fighting for an independent Irish Republic that emerged in the 1850s and was growing in strength during the 1860s when O'Reilly was a young man. In May 1863, O'Reilly enlisted in the 10th Hussars with the intention of overthrowing British rule of Ireland. We can glimpse this time in O'Reilly's life in the poem, Uncle Ned's Tale. And O'Reilly does provide some explanatory notes which help to date its composition to 1863. This piece was written while I was acting the part of a loyal English light dragoon. I had intended to write a series of Uncle Ned's Tales and in fact had completed this and another before I got tired of being an Englishman. This note provides evidence that O'Reilly entered the British Army with the intention of subterfuge and as an undercover member of the Irish Republican Brotherhood. In the 10th Hussars, which was a prestigious cavalry regiment of the Prince of Wales in the British Army, O'Reilly focused on recruiting for the Fenian movement. His sedition was not suspected until he was betrayed in February 1866 when he was arrested after an unsuccessful uprising attempt. Following O'Reilly's arrest, he was guarded in silence and isolation at Arbor Hill Prison, <coughs> Dublin. He was tried by court-martial on 27th of June, 1866, charged with not giving information and knowledge of intended mutiny in Her Majesty's forces in Ireland. And on 9th of July, 1866, O'Reilly was sentenced to death but later that day it was commuted to life imprisonment and it was further reduced to 20 years penal servitude. O'Reilly spent two years in English prisons, moving deeper into the Victorian prison system. First at Mountjoy Prison in Dublin, where the, this mugshot, that mugshot, <laughs> this mugshot, <laughs> was taken, <clears throat> and then to Pentonville Prison in London and then on to Portland Prison on the Isle of Portland in Dorset, which had opened in 1848 as the first male convict public works prison. 
Finally, the British government transported O'Reilly in October 1867, along with 61 other Fenian political prisoners, 17 of whom were military Fenians, like O'Reilly, and 279 convicts on the last convict ship to Australia bound for the convict establishment at Fremantle. Accompanying the convicts, there were 44 members of the enrolled pensioner force and their families. This may be an image of the Hugomont, but there's some contention that any image exists of the Hugomont ship. This is identified as the Hugomont in the State Library's collection of a ship of ship postcards assembled in many, many albums by Jack Edward Miller, a boatman who worked with the Harbour and Lights Department in Albany in the early 20th century. During the voyage, O'Reilly and the other Fenian prisoners were supplied with paper and writing materials by the chaplain, Father Bernard Delaney, and this was used to produce the Wild Goose newsletter. O'Reilly, like many of the Fenian prisoners, was highly literate and well-educated. He was, by all accounts, a charismatic figure, evident in his ability to recruit men to the Fenian cause while operating in the British military. It seems that he was also singular in his vision of escaping his imprisonment, and during the voyage he plotted an intended mutiny, which did not eventuate. Let's hear our own Green Isle from the book of poems written for the Irish exiles on board the Hugomont. And although this was composed on the Hugomont voyage, the poem does not appear in The Wild Goose. And I'd like to welcome Jennifer McGrath to the lectern. Why weep we for the present? Or why grieve we for the past? Why bow the head of manhood to the sterile winter blast? Why let the bud of hope be ripped and stricken ere it bloom? Why let a frown of fortune cloud our onward path in gloom? No, we will not fear like cowards nor we will not pine like slaves, but we'll fight life's battles bravely and we'll stem its troubled waves. Hope will guide us as we wander and our checkered way beguile till we meet again together in our own beloved isle. All the memories of fatherland will cheer us as we go. They will light our rugged pathway with a mild and soothing glow. We will rise o'er every barrier. Onward, still our battle cry. Never quailing, never stooping, never yielding to a sigh. Should a brother exile suffer or beneath misfortune bend, set our hands and hearts be ready to assist and to befriend. Thus we'll live as friends and brothers and we'll pray the time to come when we'll meet again together in our own Green Island home. Not a scene shall be forgotten, not one homely feeling lost. We will think and dream of fatherland where'er we may be tossed. Parents, Dear ones, friends, we'll pray for how oh, we've got the pictures here. In our hearts they're framed, but brothers, there's another one still more dear. Tis the little blue-eyed maiden, first in dream and first in prayer, ever cherished. God protect her, shield her well from every care till we turn and steer us westward, far away across the foam, when we'll press her to our bosom in our green island home. Thank you, Jennifer. O'Reilly.
Riley arrived in Fremantle in the heat of January 1868 and entered the convict establishment at Fremantle Prison. <clears throat> we don't know what possessions he arrived with, as the surviving convict property register, now held by the State Records Office, that lists the last few, the few possessions held by prisoners on arrival, only covers the period 1861 to 65. Fremantle Prison was built by convict labour in 1850 from limestone quarried from the site. It was first called the Imperial Convict Establishment, but by 1867 was known as Fremantle Prison. The prison had more than 500 cells. There were strict rules and regulations governing convict life and corporeal punishment was enforced through birching and flogging. A Protestant chapel was built in the front of the main cell block and a smaller Catholic chapel was converted from the Northern Ward in 1861. Convicts were assigned to either work parties around the colony or in the prison itself in workshops. O'Reilly was assigned clerical duties to assist Father Lynch, the prison's Catholic chaplain, in the prison library. The prison library had limited stock, mainly Bibles or books about redemption. It is thought that during the convict era, the prison library was housed in a repurposed cell. A printing press was also operational in the prison at this time. And this is where the Government Gazette was printed until 1870. Books were regularly mended at the convict establishment from very early on and paper was readily available. It is possible that O'Reilly obtained this book through Fremantle Prison or through the Catholic chaplain, Father Lynch. The prison was an imposing presence within Fremantle on high ground overlooking the town with glaring bright limestone walls in the summer sun causing blindness for some prisoners. <coughs> early maps and early photographs and rare maps in the State Library's collections show Fremantle's development around the prison, including houses for warders and pensioner guards surrounding the prison itself. These images from the State Library's collection help to set the scene of Fremantle during the 1860s and 70s. And I can't help but quote from O'Reilly in Moondyne Joe. He describes, and I quote, the little town of Fremantle with its imposing centre, the Great Stone Prison. He goes on, there is something strange, almost unaccountable, and yet terrible in the change that appears in a half, a half a century in the building of prisons. The old prisons were dark and horrible in every aspect, while the new ones are light and airy. In the latter, the bar takes the place of a wall, and the bar is often ornamented with cast iron flowers and other sightly but sardonic mockery. Better the old dungeon with all its gloom, better for the sake of humanity. The new prison is a cage, a hideous hive of order and commonplace severity, where the flooding sunlight is a derision. Hmm. Well, O'Reilly didn't spend much time in Fremantle Prison. Let's try to move this slide. I'm wanting to... Um, as within a month, he was assigned to a convict work party at Dardanup near Bunbury on the 12th of February, 1868. I'm just going to try and move this forward because we do need the images. to keep us on our toes. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. Oh, dear. Okie dokes. So we'll skip through this and this. Okay. You can see the convict depot. Oh, if I get my pointer here in this rare map. And it was an imposing presence within Fremantle, and it still is, really. It's a terrific Izzy Orloff photograph from our collection. And another one, which may even be in the Fremantle Then and Now exhibition, so we'll have a look at that afterwards. Right. 
His close friend and fellow Fenian prisoner, Dennis Cashman, reported on O'Reilly's transfer away from the prison in a letter to his wife, Kate, now held in the JY Joyner Library in East Carolina University. This is quite an incredible image. It's a, an image of Dennis Cashman when he was in Perth, and it's by Manning Knight Studios in, in Perth. And he would have sent this to Kate with one of his letters, this picture. Cashman wrote, all of my dear friends here in exile are in the greatest spirits. Really, it is wonderful to see how such a class of men can adapt themselves so easily to such an antipodean mode of life. They sing, laugh, in fact, are always Irish. I too am beginning to be broken in on convict life and not to feel life such a burden as it was at first. My dear friend J.B. O'Reilly has been sent a hundred miles away from the prison. I felt very lonely after him. In Bunbury, O'Reilly was again assigned clerical duties. He had the responsibility of delivering the weekly report from the work party to the local convict depot in Bunbury. This gave him the opportunity to get to know the community around Bunbury. He gained the trust of many around him. He developed friendships and relationships. A well-known incident involved O'Reilly halting the building of the Vass Road to protect a majestic tuit tree in its path. This reflects his poetic sensibility and love of nature, but also his influence as the tree was left standing and the road rerouted, though the tree does not survive today. This sentiment comes through in Moondine Joe too, with O'Reilly describing the beauty of the southwest forests. He writes, the scene was like a field from fairyland. No eye accustomed only to northern vegetation and climate can conceive unaided the glory of a well-watered Australian vale. High over the beauteous life of the underwood rose the grand mahogany and chewed and gum trees of the forest. It was around this time in February or March 1868 that O'Reilly met and became close to the Catholic priest, Father Patrick McCabe, the Roman Catholic chaplain at Bunbury during 1868. McCabe had arrived in Western Australia in 1859 and as a newly ordained priest from Ireland. As a fellow Irishman with sympathies to the Fenian cause, McCabe made a strong impression on O'Reilly. So much so that O'Reilly dedicated this book of poems to McCabe to thank him for his friendship and support. On 3rd of April, 1868, O'Reilly writes, this little book is respectfully dedicated as the only means by which the writer at present can evince his deep and heartfelt gratitude to him for all his kindnesses. I have written this little book to offer you, feeling confident that one who could lavish kindnesses on an utter stranger, whose only passport to his friendship was the fact of his having the honour to suffer for the old cause and the old country, must also be fully capable of appreciating all the good qualities of our nature. O'Reilly also describes his true and earnest feelings of gratitude, affection and respect, which actuated me to, to write it and offer it to you. O'Reilly wrote this book of poems as a gift for McCabe, an offer of thanks, at a time when he had limited means through which to show his gratitude. O'Reilly would have written these poems into this book in March 1868, not long after meeting McCabe. He writes the dedication on the 3rd of April, and I believe that it is likely that he gave this book to McCabe soon after in April 1868, as the rest of the book remained empty. Evidence for this period is sparse, and the events that followed. But we know that McCabe, with the help of local Irish settler, Jim Maguire, organised O'Reilly's escape from the colony of Western Australia on the American whaling ship, the Gazelle, on the 18th of February, 1869. It is possible that McCabe offered his support for O'Reilly's attempted escape from this early on in March, 1868. Indeed, the plot for such an escape attempt at this time would have likely taken months to orchestrate. Plans for escape may be alluded to in this dedication to McCabe through the words, God will hear the exile's prayer for his country as well from the depths of an austral forest as he would were it offered from the altar steps of a cathedral. 
oh, will our grand idea ever be consummated? The grand idea of Irish freedom from British rule may conceal another grand idea of O'Reilly's escape. In the following months, the plot for O'Reilly's escape took form. An attempted suicide by O'Reilly on the 27th of December, 1868, reveals his state of despair and emotional anguish. Night Thoughts, the final poem in this book, may have been composed in Western Australia, and it appears to be unfinished. It is the last entry in the book of poems. This poem reveals O'Reilly's desperate state of mind and a sense of despair at his circumstances. It may have been written many months prior to his suicide attempt. So let's hear Night Thoughts, published as Pondering in 1870. And I'd like to welcome Brigida Desabrock. Have I no future left me? Is there no struggling ray from the sun of my life out shining down on my darksome way? Will there no gleam of sunshine cast in my path its light? Will there no star of hope rise out of the gloom of night? Have I against heaven's warnings sinfully, madly rushed, else why thus were my heartstrings severed? Why was my love light crushed? Oh, I have hopes and yearnings, hopes that I know are vain, and that knowledge robs life of pleasure and death of its only pain. Thank you, Brigida. On 3rd of March, 1869, O'Reilly successfully escaped on the whaling ship, the Gazelle, and made it to America. The Book of Poems remained in Western Australia, where it eventually surfaced 120 years later, when it was donated to the State Library by Mary Nora Connor Kingston. Kingston, who was known as Molly, and in 1989 was then aged 81, was a retired barrister and one of the first graduates of law from the University of Western Australia in 1931. She, in fact, opened the first all-female law practice in Western Australia in 1934, specialising in family law. But the firm ceased practice in 1939 when Kingston joined Stone James & Co, which was one of the largest law firms in Perth. During World War II, Kingston joined the Women's Auxiliary Australian Air Force and was employed on administrative duties at the Royal Australian Air Force headquarters in Melbourne until 1945. This photograph is included in her war record, now held by the National Archives. In the post-war period, Kingston worked first in Sydney in 1946 for the Australian Institute of International Affairs, working on the post-war reorganisation of the Rockefeller Foundation. She became editor of the journal Australian Outlook, devoted to analysis of Australian foreign relations. And through this role, she corresponded with prominent figures and friends such as Paul Hasluck about the journal's content. Kingston went back to law from 1949, moving to Melbourne, where she worked as a solicitor and barrister. At one point, representing the National Council of Women in a wages case where she argued that women deserved equal pay. Later, she specialised in family law, retiring in 1978 and then returning to Western Australia. When Kingston donated the book in 1989, the State Library recorded that Kingston thought her family were in some way connected with Father Patrick McCabe. The book had been in her family for generations. 
The donation was facilitated by Dr Erica Underwood, psychologist, broadcaster, education administrator and community worker, another very accomplished and connected woman of the same generation. There is a letter in the State Library files that thanks Underwood for her role in saving this book from the rubbish tip. It seems that the book may have been destined to be discarded in the process of Kingston sorting through her papers near the end of her life. Underwood recognised the significance of this book and suggested to Kingston that she consider donating it to the State Library. Both Kingston and Underwood died in 1992, Kingston at the age of 84 and Underwood at age 85. But how was Molly Kingston's family connected to McCabe? Kingston's grandfather was James Connor, born in 1810 in County Wexford, Ireland, and her grandmother was Bridget Cullen, born 1825. They married in 1848 in Kilkenny and immigrated in 1850 to the colony of Western Australia. James was an enrolled pensioner guard and was granted land in Bunbury for his military service in 1858. Teresa Connor, known as Tess, was their daughter, born in 1866. She was one of nine children. Tess was Molly Kingston's mother. While Tess died in 1925 at the age of 59, Molly was just 17. And Molly lists her older sister, Annie McGilvray, as her next of kin in her World War II records. So what link could there be between Molly's grandfather, James Connor, and Father Patrick McCabe? James lived in Bunbury from at least 1858 until his death in 1886. Connor was part of the Irish-born Roman Catholic community in and around Bunbury at the time that McCabe was in Bunbury. Connor was ex-British military who may have empathised with the ex-military Fenian con convicts such as O'Reilly. It is plausible that McCabe may have trusted Connor and entrusted him with this book of poems when he left Western Australia in 1875, or more accurately, was moved by the Catholic Church in 1875. 1876 is a significant year. This is notable. It was the year of the escape of the six remaining military Fenians from imprisoned in Fremantle on the US whaling ship, the Catalpa. O'Reilly had played a role in organising this from Boston. McCabe would have been in a vulnerable position and authorities may have been scrutinising the role he, he had played in O'Reilly's escape on the Gazelle in 1869. Mindful of this, the Catholic Church moved McCabe in 1875, first to South Australia and then on to the USA. Was the Catholic Church aware of plans to rescue the remaining military Fenians in 1876? McCabe may have given Connor the book of poems at this point prior to him leaving Western Australia, thereby shedding evidence for his close connection with O'Reilly. It is also possible that the book of poems could have been secreted away by the Irish Catholic community of Bunbury much earlier, from about the time of O'Reilly's escape, and perhaps with a family not directly connected with the escape planning. James Connor was perhaps removed enough to be a good choice and the book remained concealed by the Connor family for another two generations through the youngest daughter of each, first Tess and then Molly. By the time Molly had the book in her possession, however, the story surrounding it was lost. Just what the relationship was between McCabe and her grandfather, James Connor, was not known by Molly, or another possibility, the relationship between Connor and O'Reilly. When it arrived at the library, extensive work was undertaken to authenticate the book and verify that indeed it was the work of John Boyle O'Reilly. This included corresponding with archivists, librarians and academics at the Boston Public Library, Boston College, National Library of Ireland, Navan Public Library in County Meath, as well as locally with the archivist as at the Catholic Archdiocese of Perth, and with academics, Associate Professor Veronica Brady at UWA and Rika Erickson. Samples of O'Reilly's handwriting and examples of his signature were sought to compare with the handwriting in the book of poems. The shorthand stenography on the front and back cover prompted the most speculation. This remained untranscribed and a mystery until 1991. 
Over a two-year period, the library had consulted the police department's criminal investigation branch to see if they were aware of the type of code that had been used on the, on the book of poems, but to no avail. Copies were shown to stenographers, and some thought it might be an early Pittman shorthand. Gillian O'Mara, a researcher and an expert on WA's convict history and a long-time volunteer of the State Library, was familiar with Pittman shorthand and offered to try to transcribe the shorthand. At the same time, efforts within the library continued to find all available samples of O'Reilly's handwriting. A staff member recalled seeing O'Reilly's signature within unlisted materials in the collection. It was then that the library discovered that a visiting researcher had, in 1981, deposited with the Batty Library a photocopy of fellow Feeney and John Flood's papers, the originals of which are held in County Meath Library. <coughs> this contained O'Reilly's signature, but it also included a stenography lesson that O'Reilly had given John Flood while on board the Hugamont. <laughs> So this was the key needed to crack O'Reilly's code. <laughs> Even with the key to the shorthand code, it took Gillian O'Mara 100 hours before she had translated enough of the characters to be sure that it was without doubt the work of John Boyle O'Reilly. The still only partially translated shorthand revealed a poem and the words by John Boyle O'Reilly, 13th of March, 68, The Bush Near Bunbury. You might think that the shorthand would conceal the plot for O'Reilly's escape, <laughs> or further, Fenian subterfuge. But what O'Reilly's tra O'Mara's transcription revealed was fragments of a love poem. The poem reads in part, I am in for it, is the end. I will be born of harm, poor Jessie. It would take a saint to give her up. I am no doubt of it. I am in love up to my ears. Curse the lot and all. Poor Jessie. And, and it goes on. And it is, it is partial. We don't have the full transcript yet. I am John. If I have proof for this is enough to convince no man each day meet, be and feel all in love. Poor Jessie. So this confirms that O'Reilly had an affair with Jessie Woodman, the daughter of his warder, Warder Woodman at Bunbury. So here is evidence for this love affair. The shorthand concealed deeply personal information which, if discovered, would have had serious consequences for O'Reilly. But why write it on the covers of this book in March 1868 in the bush near Bunbury? There is something about this act which shows his emotional state, passionate, desperate, a desire to record this illicit affair while also hiding it in plain view. It's almost like he wanted us to discover it all these years later. There are many outstanding questions around this book. And the speculative interpretation that I offer today is what I consider to be the most plausible with the available evidence. Further evidence could come to light and help to shape an interpretation of this book of poems again. And this is what makes history so exciting. This book of poems is integral to the enduring power of the story of John Boyle O'Reilly in Western Australia. The little surviving evidence means that the traces of the past and clues held in this book are all the more poignant. This book is many things, a lost archive of poems, an artefact of political history, a relic of the convict era, an early record of creative practice in Western Australia, a story of intrigue, passion and subterfuge, it offers insight into the mind of John Boyle O'Reilly, and it speaks to us across a time span of 154 years, providing a very tangible connection with the young poet John Boyle O'Reilly and his time in Western Australia. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.
Kate, thank you so much for that incredible lecture. I now invite the Honorary Consul of Ireland in Western Australia, Mr. Marty Kavna, forward to formally thank Dr. Gregory for her incredible lecture. Thank you. As we gather here in Walyalup, it's uh, very appropriate that I acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land we meet upon, the Wajuk people of the Noongar Nation, and pay my respects to elders past, present, and emerging. Thank you, Dr. Kate, for a scholarly, fascinating, and wonderful lecture. We Irish love a good story, and what a story you told us today. And it seems that WB Yeats was wrong. Romantic Ireland isn't dead and gone, and it's not with O'Leary in the grave, it's with John Boyle O'Reilly in his poetry. And how wonderfully Irish that O'Reilly's secret code wasn't about politics or escape. <laughs> we never do the obvious. It was about love. And how quaintly naive O'Reilly is when he writes, and I love this, I am in love up to my years with Jessie, and the love drive me I wish she wasn't so fond of kissing. <laughs> the innocence of it all. It makes me smile to think. Fretting, there's O'Reilly fretting in code about kissing Jesse. Uh, we may sometimes in our lives leave the Catholic Church, but Catholic guilt obviously never leaves us. <laughs> In this uh, decade of uh, remembrance where we, sell it, where, we, where we mark the War of Independence, the Civil War, and the foundation of the Irish Free State, I recently came across some video footage of the, SD, the late SDLP leader and Nobel Peace Laureate um, John Hume, who quoted Oscar Wilde's great line, where he said, the problem with the English is that they can't remember history, and the problem with the Irish is that we never forget it. But history is important, and as an Irishman, it gladdens my heart to see such a full theatre here today. Australians, those of us who were born in Ireland, those of us who are Irish by ancestry, and those of us who just wish we were Irish. <laughs> and we're all here to remember one of Australia's most significant heroes in the fight for Irish independence. I think if history teaches us anything, it teaches us that we should take the long view. And the J.B. O'Reilly story tells us a few key points. One, empires, empires rise and empires fall. Small nations can defeat might and empire, and individuals can make a great difference. The Roman Empire lasted over a thousand years, but all we have left now is the ruins. And about a month ago, I found myself in Pompeii, among the ruins of Pompeii, and I laughed when the tour guide told me that the only two-story building to survive the volcano was the most popular brothel. <laughs> now, I'm sure that the Caesars of the Roman Empire hoped that they'd be remembered or there'd be a lot more remaining than the two-story brothel. But who would have thought that Little Old Ireland could take on and defeat the might of the British Empire? Of course, if you ask Cork people, that was all due to one man, Michael Collins. But the rest of us had a role as well. Ireland achieved her independence through force and war. But we also achieved independence by preserving over many centuries our culture, our music, and our poetry. But history isn't all about the past. As we meet here today in beautiful Walilup, it's important to remember the very real struggle going on in Ukraine. Yet again, the arc of history shifts. Ukraine's struggle today reminds us of the struggle of our ancestors for Irish independence. Whilst it's commonly known that Ireland is a neutral country militarily, we are not neutral politically. Ireland stands for Ukraine. Those are not just cheap words. The Irish people and the government of Ireland have taken in and welcomed over 55,000 refugees as we stand here today. For a small country, this is no feat, particularly a, co a country in the midst of a historic housing crisis. Ireland stands with Ukraine because we know how brutal and deadly empire can be. We know as well that empires rise and empires fall. Who knows how many J.B. O'Reilly's Ukraine will produce in its war against empire. Whilst the leading role of President Zelensky is well known, how many individuals risk their lives write poems, and fight for the future of their country. 
I'm sure Ukraine will have many J.B. O'Reilly's, and let's hope that that independence for Ukraine comes sooner rather than later. On behalf of the Perth community, uh, the Irish community in Perth, we thank Margot and the Fenians Fremantle uh, Association for delivering yet another fine lecture in a great series of the Wild Goose. And isn't it wonderfully romantic to think that the geese go, they spend some time away, and they come back? If ever there's a symbol for Irish and our, uh, us being a, a country of migrants, it's a very apt metaphor. And thank you to uh, Fremant Fenians Fremantle and Freedom Association for your vital contribution towards keeping our culture alive and relevant. Dr. Kate, thank you once again for a fascinating and memorable lecture. And I would also thank you and your colleagues at the State Library for the obvious meticulous care you've taken of this book and how much research you've done into John O'Boyle's life, John Boyle O'Reilly's life. I will not dare to try even compete with the wonderful readers of J.B. O'Reilly's poetry today. Um, but we Irish are, uh, we love poetry and we love the spoken word. And we are unashamedly sentimental and romantic, and long may it continue. So if I may, may I leave you with one of my favorite poems, a poem that was voted the second most popular poem in Ireland. He Wishes for the Cloths of Heaven by W.B. Yeats. Had I the, hev the heavens embroidered cloths and wrought with golden and silver light, the blue and the dim and the dark cloths of night and light and the half light, I would spread the cloths under your feet but I, being poor, have only my dreams. I have spread my dreams under your feet. Tread softly because you tread upon my dreams. Thank you, Marty. Co-chair of Fenians, Fremantle and Freedom, Margot O'Byrne, will now step forward to present Kate with a gift from our committee. Before we finish up and head off to the Irish music session in the Chesterfield Lounge up at Bar Orient, I have a few final thank yous from the Fremantle Fenians <laughs> Committee. We extend our sincere appreciation to Dr. Alec Coles and all at the WA Museum and here at the Maritime Museum, the State Library of Western Australia, Honorary Consul of Ireland in Western Australia, Mr. Marty Kavna, our readers, Michael, Jennifer and Brigida. Fred, for your singing and that fantastic Boston Pilot newspaper which Fred has made available for you today. Dave Primer of Mixed Media. Tracy Routledge of TRPR. Terra Rosa Consulting. Frank Murphy and Jerry Grogan on Celtic Rambles at Radio Fremantle. Our musicians, which you'll hear shortly up at Bar Orient. All the committee members and volunteers of the Fremantle Fenians, without whose help today would not have been possible. And finally again, Dr. Kate Gregory. That concludes today's proceedings. As I mentioned, we hope to see you all very shortly at Bar Orient, where the music will kick off from 5pm. Gurav Mila Mahagwiv Galair, Agus Slán Agus Banach. <laughs>